every hospital should be prepared for an Ebola patient and should be able to be managed and an Ebola patient at least for the first um, 48 hours and no hospital is on their own per se. Um, there will be CDC will dispatch a team. This country will continue to have medical personnel and other personnel coming back from West Africa where they've been working, um, taking care of people, and there will be an occasional case. I do not think we need to worry about an epidemic here. The, the culture is different. We have hand washing facilities everywhere. Right now the risk of somebody just randomly showing up with Ebola in this country is, is very, very low. Welcome to this special edition of Wyoming Signatures. Two months ago, Ebola was considered public enemy number one as the first cases appeared in this country. At one point, nearly 1,000 people were being monitored by health officials, and schools in Texas and Ohio closed because one person with the disease boarded a plane. As of now, however, the United States is Ebola-free, at least for the time being. How did we get from there to here? Is Wyoming ready in the event Ebola comes to our state? Tonight, we're going to answer those and other questions. We start with nursing professor Pam Clark of the University of Wyoming. During the height of our recent Ebola scare, she was attending a national conference of which many of the attendees were elite health workers specializing in public health. Dr. Clark herself was a public health nurse for much of her career. She joined us earlier to give an overview of the disease and the epidemic. Dr. Clark, we know that Ebola is not a brand new disease, even though its introduction to this country is relatively new. What can you tell us about the history? The history of the disease um, that's been recently documented indicates that the Ebola Zaire, which is the most infectious strain, began and was identified in 1976. But there's some recent theories that perhaps the Black Plague of the 1300s was Ebola instead of bubonic plague. Now that hasn't been confirmed, but that's some hypothesizing that's going on. So it's been with us for quite a long time. I think it's been with us for a very long time. So the, the fear that it could become airborne would be, uh, uh, yeah, kind, would of, be kind of kind of crazy. Right, yes. And then uh, as far as the actual illness itself, how is it different than the flu? How would a, how, what kind of symptoms would a person with Ebola experience? Well, it would start out similar to the flu and um, with the aches and pains and fever, that achy feeling that you have with the flu, a headache. Um, but then with the flu, you usually don't have nausea and vomiting um, and the other kinds of symptoms. And Ebola, very quickly moves into the d whole digestive phase, the vomiting, diarrhea, um, and, and really being so ill. I mean, you've seen people that just be, they can walk a minute and then they collapse. Um, they're really, it's, it is um, overwhelming for the person that has it. It does affect inter internal organs and yes, causes internal yes, bleeding. Right. Right, and so the other difference is that it's not spread by air. It's spread by body fluids. So um, if you and I were sitting together and we, I was worried that you had influenza, I might want to have a barrier between us. Um, but if you had Ebola and we're three feet apart and we don't exchange body fluids or, or hold hands or anything, then um, I'd be pretty safe. It is not that contagious. Many health officials, now you've just said it too, that it is very difficult to contract, but yet, but how does this explain the numbers of people, especially in West African countries, who um, are getting it and dying from it? Well, you've got to picture West Africa, first of all, um, not necessarily uh, toilets with hand washing facilities. Um, they talk about it on the news, explosive diarrhea, people can't always get to the bathroom. Um, that's, and the whole culture in Africa is a very close family unit and the culture has been, the Muslim culture has been to wash the bodies of the uh, 
you know, like if your mother died, it, it's part of your culture. So you'd want to wash the bodies. The family would participate in that. So it's very hard for people to have a burial team come in and grab the body that you haven't even touched because you don't want to get Ebola and drag it away in a body bag. Um, it, it's, it, it's very hard to, I think most um, of the cases in Africa have been in between family members that have had that kind of intimacy. What would make the single biggest difference in um, stemming that epidemic there? Well, I think it's starting. I think it's starting to stem, and you, and you see some of the numbers going down. Um, the um, understanding of the people had to happen in terms of how it spread, and they finally have some protective clothing and gloves to wear. So if the if you suspect your baby uh, has Ebola, it's not that you're not going to pick the baby up, but now you might put on gloves and, and a gown to pick the baby up um, to get it to the hospital and that sort of thing. So, so I think it's starting to happen. Um, a vaccine would be excellent, but we're not at that stage yet. Uh, how close do you think we might be? Well, some of the um, literature claims that it could be as early as January. Um, but that still leaves time for testing, the possible failures, um, and then, you know, reformulation of the vaccine. So I, I just wouldn't expect it to come out perfect in January. Of those uh, patients in the United States that um, got Ebola, um, a surprising number of them have survived. Yes, w yes. What would be the reason for that? Well, there's a huge difference in treatment facilities between the U.S. and West Africa. Um, in West Africa, they try to treat the symptoms. It's all, all treatment of symptoms. So they can do IVs and try to rehydrate people, which, which is quite difficult, actually, given how much fluid they lose when they're sick. Um, and in this country, we have you know, excellent mechanisms. We have ventilators. If they go into kidney failure, which many of them do and, and then die, um, we have dialysis to help them through that phase. And if you can keep the person alive long enough, they will survive. So it's not just the miraculous antibody serum that saved the lives of I don't folks. believe it is at all, no. Um, and while they didn't, weren't able to get um, Thomas Duncan uh, treated, treated early enough first, I mean, that's the big thing. If you can get the person in early, um, that'll uh, make a big difference, and then um, give them the full treatment. And while those other things may help, they may help, but we don't really know if they help. In the United States, do you see a massive epidemic to the proportions of what's going on in West Africa? Uh, no. Um, I know. It, it really couldn't happen here in the same way. Um, we have, everybody's hysterical about it. Now there's been a movie out that was called Contagion that um, had Ebola-like symptoms in it. Um, and I think it's easy to get um, fearful, and especially for people who maybe don't understand science as well, the science part of it, including some of the governors. Um, but in this country, we really can quarantine people. We, they do understand um, what, what the concept of quarantine means. We don't have a culture where we, I mean, we understand we can wear protective clothing. Um, so that kind of thing. It, I, it, it won't happen here, but I understand there are many people fearful that it will happen here. So what do you need to run a, an, an effective quarantine? What, 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 describe for me what that would look like. Well, an effective quarantine, can, it can be anything. It's defined specifically by CDC as um, keeping the person away from other people. But if you look at the CDC de definition, it also includes providing um, meals and water and all the things that people would need to do to, to be in quarantine and stay there. And if, if you remember the um, family of Thomas Duncan, they were left in that apartment with his dirty um, clothes and sheets and all, all that kind of thing for days, four days, and um, they didn't have f enough food there. So that, that was um, an in inappropriate way to do the quarantine. Why is it important that we not give up the fight against Ebola in Western African countries? 
Well, in today's world, it's a global, it's a global economy. People travel from uh, all sides of the world back and forth doing uh, trade kinds of things. It, it, it seems like in this country we've been so focused on ourselves, protecting ourselves, even if we didn't live next to the hospital in Texas um, or reside in Maine, um, there's kind of been this anger toward people who either had Ebola or might have it. Um, and where we really need to focus our attention is in West Africa. Until we can control and settle that epidemic some, there will always be more risk um, coming back here. But there's, there's going to have to be a really e big effort on, on getting it settled there. Pam, thanks for your insight. <laughs> You're welcome. And now we turn to state epidemiologist Dr. Tracy Murphy for an understanding of preparedness in our state. So Dr. Murphy, uh, what role do you think state government has in how Ebola patients are treated and, and when it comes to preventing its spread in Wyoming? For the prevention, our main role is in the identifying people who need to be monitored. Uh, protecting public health by monitoring those people. So we've identified processes to have people who may have been exposed to Ebola take their temperature, watch for symptoms. Uh, we check in and record that information, keep track of it, give information on what sort of restrictions that person may be under. Um, some of the very high-risk folks may be under under uh, home confinement for a period of time. Most people won't be. We're not taking the approach of automatic mandatory quarantine like you may have heard some states in the East are doing, but there could be some high-risk folks who, who would need that and we would coordinate that and, and order that if needed. As far as the actual care of the patient, the testing would go through the public health lab here in Cheyenne. We would work with CDC on having that tested there or uh, somewhere else where the capabilities exist for that testing. We would report that back to the provider and then, then coordinate with them on if the patient should be transferred or if the care will remain there. Say a doctor, a family doctor comes across a case, <clears throat> would he know what to do? Well, as far as identifying people who, who may be at risk, the Centers for Disease Control issued some guidance uh, a week or so ago about uh, categorization of, of the risks and what they would recommend be done. Uh, we generally agree with those and, and we'll be following those, so we have shared those with partners, hospitals, healthcare providers throughout the state to be familiar with what we would do. These are people who are not sick, uh, most of them will be people who have came, came from the West Africa countries and may have had various exposures. Some are volunteers, uh, some are government workers. So they're not sick, but they would be monitored. It's very unlikely anybody in Wyoming would come across somebody with symptoms of Ebola that hasn't already been identified as being in one of those risk groups. Right now in this country, there's not community transmission, it's only been in some healthcare settings uh, with identified risks. So it's possible somebody could have been in West Africa and slipped through the cracks of being identified, but it's, it's really unlikely. So I think we will know ahead of time which people are at risk and then through the monitoring hopefully catch it in early stages to alert, to alert providers and hospitals about the possibility. The identification of these folks at risk is supposed to be done at the screening airports where they enter the mm. country. The federal government has a system for that and then they notify the state. However, it's possible that that some of those people could slip through and uh, employers, local public health or the person themselves may notify us and then we would discuss the process with them. The World Health Organization recently you know, suggested guidelines on treating Ebola patients and it said that only highly trained medical professionals should take on the job of caring for Ebola patients. And I think about the variety of people who can handle um, fluids from Ebola patients or Ebola patients themselves, anywhere from a custodian to a doctor. How do you 
go about training that many different types of people on methods? And how do you regulate their activities? Ideally, based on past history of Ebola, it, it, you were able to dedicate people who had been trained to take care of Ebola, especially in this country because it was confined to Africa. So people who went over were part of, of aid groups or mission groups like Doctors Without Borders and they received training. For people going over there, that, that still is the case. It should only be people who have been specifically trained in the care for Ebola patients. However, you know, should a patient or, or a person who's been infected travel to the United States, such as we saw in Dallas, the person could show up anywhere. Now, with the new uh, screening process at the airports, hopefully those people are identified and we know they're there, but they can go anywhere in the country. And so hospitals everywhere, including Wyoming, need to understand how they would respond if a patient who was at risk for Ebola did become ill. So in that case, we don't have the luxury of restricting the care to only people who've been specifically trained in Ebola because you know, the government's not restricting travel of those people and they could be in Wyoming or anywhere. So every hospital needs to be prepared to at least initially assess the person on the likelihood of Ebola isolate the person, take precautions to protect themselves and their staff, and work with the public health on testing and confirming and isolating the patient. It is very tough for the smaller hospitals in Wyoming to become adept at that. Um, most of them don't have enough uh, the protective equipment offhand to deal with it, so they're trying to acquire it, they're training staff on it, the same with, with ambulance services. So it is taking some, some training and some work. And you know, I would agree, I, ideally, the situation would be where a person gets sick in Africa and gets flown over to a biocontainment unit, such as, as uh, some of the, the American workers have so far. But we also have to face the reality that we may have a situation such they had in Dallas where that's just not the case. And so we can't just say we can't deal with it. It's there, you're faced with it. You, you have to deal with it the best you can. Being here at the University of Wyoming, I think of how many students we have that are international students. And I don't know how many we have from those parts of Africa that are experiencing the Ebola outbreak. What do you, how do you, deal with that. They probably want to go home and see their families and then they want to come back and they want to go to school. I agree with the federal government's recommendation that non-essential travel to those countries not take place and that includes edu education travel. If uh, we do have students from those countries that have family over there, you know, it may be considered essential travel that, and they want to go, they would be subject to the same entry screening at airports as anybody else when they come back. So, so the federal government is, is having all the pay passengers from those countries go to selected airports and then there's a screening process where they assess them for illness but also talk about potential exposures they may have had in, in Africa they classify the risk based on what they know, then they notify state public health officials that the person will be arriving, and when they arrive, local and state public health contact that person, gather all the information we need to to completely categorize their risk and make recommendations on, on movement restrictions, if any. And that would apply to, apply to students too. Do you have any final thoughts of something we haven't touched on? Right now, the risk of somebody just randomly showing up with Ebola in this country is, is very, very low. The reason I can't say it's non-existent because I don't know how complete the entry screening at the airports is, I suppose it's possible somebody could be missed. But, but it's not being spread in the, in the communities here. Uh, somebody in Wyoming right now who hasn't been exposed to a person diagnosed with Ebola or been in Africa, and particularly the, the three affected countries of Guinea, Sierra, Le Sierra Leone, and Liberia, they're, they're not at risk of just acquiring Ebola.
That was state epidemiologist Tracy Murphy again emphasizing that detection of Ebola cases in the U.S. would likely be prior to someone arriving in Wyoming. Well, in the event that the disease should spread here, how prepared are our hospitals? We turn now to infectious disease specialist Dr. Hu Feng Chu of Cheyenne Regional Medical Center, one of the larger and more advanced care facilities in our state. Dr. Chu, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you for joining us. It's so, a pleasure to be here. So you have a potential Ebola patient walk into the emergency room at Cheyenne Regional Medical Center. Um, are you ready for this? We, we are ready. Um, we have been prepared for quite a while now. and. We are following the CDC guidelines and keeping up, up to date with uh, updated guidelines. I think it's important also to have protocols prepared. We have been training for this um, as, a as part of a community in addition with the hospital and the Wyoming Department of Health. Um, there are certain aspects to preparation, there are multiple steps to the preparation, and I think we gather a lot of information from lessons learned from previous hospitals, including Emory and also Nebraska cases. So I think, so we are prepared. I think it's a learning process also in terms of getting at not only a learning process, but repetition in terms of getting everything prepared. Would you really want someone who thinks they might have Ebola come into the hospital first, or should they call? So, Medicine is unpredictable, and as the CDC says, um, every hospital should be prepared for an Ebola patient and should be able to be managed, and an Ebola patient at least for the first um, 48 hours, and no hospital is on their own per se. Um, there will be, CDC will dispatch a team. Um, I think it's important that um, Whoever is called 911 for symptoms of Ebola uh, should, I think a travel history is very important for us to really confirm whether it's truly Ebola and also give um, preparation for the uh, first aid responders and also for the hospital. So ideally, you would want someone to call and not just come to the hospital first? Ideally, if they're stable enough, they should call. For example, like the New York case, the New York physician, he pretty much called uh, um, the Doctors Without Borders and then um, he called the Department of Health. And I think with it's a more controlled environment if um, the first responders were notified and called for a suspected Ebola case rather than showing up in the emergency room. You mentioned that there would be CDC um specialists on hand assisting, that it wouldn't be just a local hospital dealing with this on their own. Um, I have read, I've been told, that there are only four facilities in this country which can treat and contain Ebola. Is that true? And would this be a scenario where, say, a case would be identified and then a special uh, SWAT team of CDC workers would come in and take this person over to one of these four centers? So that's a very good question. Um, I will raise the point as to um, there are like four or five biocontainment center in the U.S., but um, an Ebola, for example, again, back to the New York City uh, physician, he's treated at Bellevue Hospital. That's not considered a biocontainment center. Um, so he's treated, no one has contracted Ebola um, treating him. So I think it's, it's just proper PPE, which is the personal protective equipment, protocols in place, so I, I disagree with that statement that um, patients need to be in a biocontainment center to be treated appropriately. Um, and I will revert back to West Africa. Uh, these countries do not have a biocontainment center. Um, they do not have a negative pressure room. Um, Doctors Without Borders has been managing um, Ebola for over 35 years, um, so we can manage Ebola. And you have the protective uh, suiting on hand for your staff? So we are following CDC guidelines for the personal protective equipment. And I would stress that every hospital should um, modify or over um, modified or be safer um, 
to the CDC guidelines. Basically, the stressing point is uh, bear no skin in these personal protective equipment. So um, all parts of the body should be covered. We do have a, a PAPR, um, which is the respiratory system to prevent aerosolized droplet from causing infections. Um, there's gowns, masks, headgears, booties, etc. And the hospital also designate a special part of the emergency room for handling those patients. And it is a negative pressure room just for abundance of caution and for aerosolized uh, procedures, et cetera. How many patients could you handle at once that might be suspected of having Ebola? Um, that might be a tough question. Our unit has quite a few beds. The, 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 the decision-making unit, um, probably how many beds, like five? There's a shower there, um, there's, again, we do not need negative pressure per se to handle Ebola, it's drop like on contact precautions. Um, again, the CDC and the Wyoming Department of Health will assist with those cases, and if patients need to be transferred to hire a designated Ebola center, it should occur. This antibody serum has been very helpful, perhaps, in um, helping uh, the few patients in this country to survive this disease. Um, would that be something at your disposal that you could offer potential patients? It's always an option, and I think, I think we need to stress that these serum um, or antibodies that have been used from previous patients who have survived Ebola. It's not a random, randomized controlled trial, so we cannot really confirm whether that helped mm -hmm. or whether aggressive supportive therapy in terms of electrolytes, um, replacement, volume, resuscitation, etc., benefited more than those serums. So I think at this point, it is unclear unless we have a randomized controlled trial. But would someone who is a patient in your facility have access to this type of treatment? It is always an option, yes. It should be on the table and should not be discarded. And obviously, it, CDC and other healthcare provider, Wyoming Department of Health, can probably assist in deciding that also. Dr. Chu, thank you for joining us. Thank you. We'd like to thank Dr. Chu, Dr. Murphy, and Professor Clark for joining us in this discussion. We at UWTV wish you happy trails. Until next time, I'm Mary Young. Set furnishings provided courtesy of Mountain Woods Furniture in historic downtown Laramie.